2.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, Nomads No More. Mongolia's nomadic herders settle in the city, but life there is proving to be a challenge. Urban Contagion. How urbanization is spreading out from the Chinese capital into a nearby county. And farming in an urban jungle. A movement to plant and harvest food in the city takes root in Hong Kong. I'm Li Jiejun, and this is Assignment Asia. Asia is the cradle of traditional living, but its cities are also expanding fast. Urban centers are drawing more and more migrants from the countryside. This is true for the Mongolian capital. Herders who fled harsh conditions in the Mongolian steppe have settled down in Ulaanbaatar and bring with them their old lifestyle. But as Polly Jacob reports, there is a lack of urban services for them, and adjusting to city life is more challenging than they expected. Mana Mongo de Girodot, Unhirti Kirai, Saran Sotsud, Girodo Yahoo Absarham, Yamus Nuxit Aragata Sixth. Washing shut the Hawaii was tennis. Dambadarja van der Dorch is a former nomad. Though now settled, he continues many nomadic traditions, like drinking salty malt tea in his prized traditional silver bowl. For centuries, his people have roamed the plains of Mongolia, relying on a unique tent-style home that Mongolians call a ger. A typical ger is a circular single-room tent supported by wooden lattice frames and lined with felt. Traditionally, gers are seen across Mongolia's vast steppe. But today, hundreds of thousands can be seen in the suburbs of the capital, Ulaanbaatar. The problem is, they were never designed for city life. <laughs> Many of the city's migrants are former nomadic herders who lost their animals over a series of harsh winters. Between 1998 and 2002, more than 11 million livestock, including goats, yaks, horses and cows, died. This left many nomadic families without a livelihood. Desperate, most of them came to the capital. In the last two decades, Ulaanbaatar's population has more than doubled to over 1.3 million inhabitants. Over the years, hundreds of thousands of migrant families moved to the city seeking better lives for themselves. And while the population expanded, urban services did not. The only place available for the newcomers was out here in the outlying suburbs that became the Gare districts. And today, the Gare districts account for more than 60% of Ulaanbaatar's total population. Damba Darja moved to Ulaanbaatar in 1996. Like many long-time settlers, he built a small house to replace his gear, but his relative's gear still filled his yard. Harsh winters aren't the only reason the migrants have come here. In 2003, a court ruled that every Mongolian was entitled to 700 square meters of land. Many claimed land around the city center and set up their gears. But city planners hadn't expected such a huge influx into Ulaanbaatar. As a result, these districts have little to no urban services. Roads are unpaved. There is no public sewage system and no easy access to water. In winter, coal-fired stoves are the only heating option. International agencies and NGOs say Gear residents really lack the basics. In the apartments, currently the average usage is about 175 litres per person per day. In the Gear area, it's about nine and a half. Just to give you an idea, in an emergency situation for refugees, the goal is 15 liters per person per day. You have um, groundwater pollution in the Gare area due to the toilets and also the gray water. 
In the past, the government thought the problem could be solved by moving the residents into apartments. For Khan Suren Dorj, a government school teacher who moved here in 2012, an apartment is a much better option. <laughs> Khan Suren was selected for an affordable housing project initiated by the government. Though cheaper than the market price, she is really stretching the limits to afford the apartment. She borrowed about $16,000 from relatives for a down payment and also got a bank loan of about $25,000. She worries she'll barely be able to afford her payments, especially when her children go off to college. Many like Khan Suren have the same problem. Even with subsidized prices, apartments are still too expensive for most Gear dwellers. So instead, the government is planning to develop the city around the Gear districts. <laughs> Plans include restructuring the gear areas, paving the main roads, and bringing water, sewage, and heating to these neighborhoods. In May 2014, the government also signed a $16 million deal with the Asian Development Bank to fund the Gare Area Development Program. Some of the work has started, but progress is slow because Mongolia's extreme climate is a challenge. There is a lot of details, but in general, you have the climate who change a lot of uh, uh, things because, for example, putting infrastructure in the minus 40 degree uh, every winter is another, is another scale of putting the infrastructure in a tropical country. Most gay residents are excited about the government's new policies. They say this plan is more practical than the one that proposed moving them into apartments. Bringing more basic services to the farther reaches of the city is going to be expensive, but many believe the government is moving in the right direction. Frankly speaking, we, the, the change is already on the table. You have to understand that GEAR was not even in the city master plan before. And very recently, it's, it's in the city master plan for the first time. GEARs have always been a part of the Mongolian identity. And while people long for better infrastructure, many believe the gear will always have its place. Ulaanbaatar's challenge is a unique one, how to incorporate an old lifestyle tradition into the urban landscape. And while the plans are falling into place, that challenge could determine the future for the city's settled nomads. For Simon Asia, I'm Pearly Jacob in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Outside groups have stepped in to help Mongolia's former nomads. In 2015, the Asian Development Bank launched a project to build roads and supply water to eight communities. Earlier, the Asia Foundation put up a website to help residents access community services. Next on the Simon Asia, we meet county residents in China who travel to the capital every day to make a living. Meet China's decision makers and thought leaders. See them in action, hear their views. 
debate their policies. Meet China's leaders with me. I'm Robert Lawrence Kim. From Mongolia, we move to China, where a wave of urbanization is attracting more people to work in cities. Every day, some 300,000 workers from a county in Hebei province commute 30 kilometers to Beijing. Yin Hang traveled to Yanjiao County and met its people who are taking advantage of the cheaper living costs there, while seeking opportunities at the Chinese capital. 5.30 a.m., Yanjiao County, Hebei province. These people are standing in the frigid weather, waiting for the first bus that will take passengers to Beijing. When the bus arrives, it's a shoving match to get on. That's right, these people aren't the ones riding the bus. Monday to Friday, these people wait for the bus. It's like a kind of part-time job. 60-year-old Qin Guizhen has been coming here for four years. She used to save a place for her daughter, now she does it for her son-in-law. Yanjiao County is just over the border from Beijing city limits and 30 kilometers away from the Beijing city center. Its economic livelihood depends heavily on Beijing. About a half a million people live here, 300,000 of them work in the capital. That means 300,000 people spend between two and six hours a day traveling to and from work. But the almost unbearable commute hasn't scared people away. There's an incentive for living this far. First, unlike Beijing, there's an unrestricted house purchasing policy in Hebei province, where Yanjiao is located. It's also closer to the Beijing city center than even some districts within Beijing itself. And property prices are much lower here. In Beijing, they've tripled over the last decades. So for now, people are snapping up homes in Yanjiao while they still can. Today, apartments are up for sale in these buildings. There are thousands of people in line to look at or buy one of these apartments because the competition here is so fierce that people are likely to do everything like standing for hours in cold weather. Li Jianhua is one of them. She says if she wants to own a home, she has to buy here. Yi 那虽然路上交通可能会有一些这个影响，耽误呀，或者比较累啊，但是回到家以后，你有一个这种呃舒适的一个居住的环境，其实比较重要的，尤其对于上班族来说。This a tradition in China to make wise investments while you're still young. Buying property is one of them. It's because all aspects of life in China are rooted in the family. Only a home means stability for the family, as well as a mark of success and maturity.
，是我们社会生活实践的那种凝练、那种反应。过去的话，奴役社会那主要什么？一个就是人们生活的基本条件就是就有土地，从事农业生产，有饭吃，然后有居住。Because property prices are spiking in Beijing, people are turning to Yanjiao, and property here is selling fast. What's happening in Yanjiao represents a trend across China. In 2010, government statistics indicated that 50% of the Chinese people now live in the cities, rather than just 30% 10 years earlier. That means the cities are being inundated with people and the population will inevitably expand outward. In Yanjiao, it means small commuters traveling to Beijing, so the city's infrastructure has to catch up. While most people travel by bus, more are turning to legal and illegal taxis as an alternative. And there are plans to add a new subway line to save time for commuters. But this is just one step towards building Yanjiao into a satellite city that works with the Beijing system. This is the 是吧？像北京，过去的话，十年是吧？有的年份我们将近一百万的外来人口的增加，这是什么概念？一个中等城市或者一个大城市，在一年就在北京就叠加了，<笑>所以他对的话，在公共基础设施的这个压力，对公共服务的这种压力，这的话呢，是很多人的话呢是想象不到的。我们只是看到，北京怎么越来越挤呀、啊？是吧？垃圾越来越多呀，是吧？等等，就我们看的是这种现象。实际上的话呢，那么人进来干嘛？寻求自己的发展机会。所以这次我们这个经济舱协同发展，这是中央战略，政府正在着力加以解决。但是我个人觉得，我们的话呢，不能抱一些个不切实际的这种诉求，是吧？还要从我们。目前的这种实际条件出发，是吧？毕竟这是一个过程，但是我们正在向好的方向发展。For the last ten years, housing prices in Yanjiao have quadrupled. So, from an investment perspective, it's paying off to own a home here. For many, the sacrifice of living this far from Beijing is worth it, even if it means standing in cold weather. After hours of waiting, the children take their place on the bus and head to work. Commuting to work is just the first step for the day. It will be followed by hours of hard work and another long ride home. But the payoff is huge. They will always have a home to go back to, the most valued concept in China. For Simon Asia, I'm in Kong in Yanjiao County, Hebei Province, China. In 2017, Beijing plans to move most of its municipal departments to the suburban district of Tongzhou, which is near Yanjiao. Aside from easing congestion in the capital, this move is seen to boost Yanjiao's housing market and improve transportation. Coming up, how urban agriculture is taking shape in Hong Kong.
an urban jungle like Hong Kong, green spaces are rare. Food has to be grown and sold somewhere else. But some residents have begun putting up farms on top of buildings. It's called vertical farming. And experts say this could change not only the landscape, but also the lifestyle here in Hong Kong. Seven million people, 8,000 skyscrapers, one of the planet's most densely populated cities. Crammed onto a few tiny islands. Agriculture almost does not exist in Hong Kong, with only a little of a percentage of land used for farming. But some are trying to find alternative spaces to grow food. This is a vegetable garden that seems no different from any other. But it's in an unlikely place, above the rooftop of a 14-story building in eastern Hong Kong. Looking down from above, the patch of green stands out in the concrete jungle. It's a patch of hope that agriculture can thrive even in one of the world's most congested cities. Osborne Lamb started operating this farm five years ago. He is the first man in the city to grow food on the rooftop of skyscrapers. The farm, less than a quarter of a football court in size, has 500 planter boxes. Each box is for rent at 20 US dollars a month and is capable of producing 14 kilograms of vegetables a year. Osborne now has three vertical farms in different locations, helping city gardeners enjoy fresh and organic produce. He says market demand is huge. If you look at it you know, from the Google map, I mean, uh, especially a city like Hong Kong is very congested, you know, uh, uh, but you can still see a lot of rooftop, you know, that's left unused or unattended. Um, so if by making use of this rooftop, which has good sunshine, you know, I mean, good air flows, and turn it into vegetable production, it could be a way to solve, you know, I mean, the, uh, the, the food supply, even though it starts with a minimal, you know, sort of percentage. In the, in the food supply chain. But it is a very valuable, low, really low carbon footprint vegetable production. The space staff the city produces only 2% of its own food. The rest largely needs to be trucked in from the Chinese mainland. So more and more people who demand local organic food are looking skyward. It is a congested city already and it has an all year round uh, climate or weather for, for growing vegetables. So unlike, you know, Tokyo or New York, I mean, it is very cold in the winter. But in Hong Kong, it's in the tropical, you know, zone, so we can grow vegetables all year round. The soil is specially um, prepared for the, um, uh, the climate here, because in Hong Kong, occasionally you have really serious rainfall the soil needs good drainage, you know, in order to make it suitable for the, for the crops. Dixon Despomier, an ecologist at Columbia University, introduced the concept of vertical farming in 1999. It creates a world where every town can have their own food source and where an elevator ride can transport people to nature's grocery store. It's not just about feeding people, but also protecting the environment. You don't just have a, a so-called sky woodland. You also have a high attraction for both people and wildlife. And with regard to wildlife, you can enhance the urban biodiversity in our city. And of course, with, the, with woodland or vegetation on the rooftop, you can also cool the city very effectively. And for those living on the top floor, if you have a green roof above you, you will have a much cooler indoor space. So you would use uh, much less air conditioning and it will also reduce the effect of climate change. So experts say vertical greening is a good way to green Hong Kong. Gardens on the roofs, 
gardens on the walls. Located in an old industrial area, this old building brings vitality to the dance blocks. Its designers say the target is to create some casual green space for its users and the nearby neighborhood. The Wolf Garden and also the Fertile Green Wall will have a three major benefits for us. I think the first one is about the amenity. Everyone would like to have a look with going to the Fertile Green Wall. It looks very nice, very green, it's like a green building. And second is about the environmental benefit. Green Wolf and the Fertile Green Wall can mitigate the heat island effect, which is a major thing that we are now trying to tackle in the urban context. And second, it can help the insulation of the building envelope. That means that you have a better protection for the building from the solar heat gain. So in that case, you can reduce your building energy requirements. So I think all those three elements is very good benefit of having a greenery in the urban context. Architects say vertical greening is a growing trend, and they are working towards that direction. Taking the concept further, one Spanish architect even proposed building 185-meter farm towers in one Hong Kong district. Made of lightweight recycled materials, the towers would grow food from liquid nutrients instead of soil. On a series of rotating floor plates, that would give props the maximum amount of sunlight. The idea drew mixed reactions from residents. They look very fanciful on paper, but I'm always wary of the um, sustainability of such um, endeavors because, uh, first of all, it's very expensive to build. And then secondly, it's not easy to maintain. And thirdly, you have to find the right technology and materials, and uh, of course, the maintenance skills to, to run all these. As there are still challenges to make such fantasy buildings come to life, it's more practical to green the existing buildings. Imagine a city where food can be produced, where it's consumed, where skyscrapers are filled with flowers, fruits, and vegetables. Like Osbert, people hope that one day, the patch of green in the concrete jungle can be expanded to a green paradise. Hong Kong's government said it would invest more to develop local agriculture. Despite the costs, experts see vertical farming as the most logical way forward for the city. You can learn more about this and all the stories on today's program on our website www.assignment-asia.com Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Li Jiechun. Thanks for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia.